We're going to begin with a pileup, a convergence of big money and big legal problems for former President Trump, all of it happening today. First, today's the day he must post a $464 million bond in his civil fraud case or risk losing some of those famous properties. The decision could chip away at his political brand as well as a savvy billionaire and a deal maker. And on top of that, he's expected in court today on the separate hush money criminal matter. Robert Costa is here. He's trying to keep track of it all for us, doing a great job. Bob, good morning. Good morning. Former President Trump's lawyers have said securing the bond would not be possible due to insurmountable difficulties. But so far, New York's attorney general has rejected that argument and signaled she's ready to seize Trump's assets. Trump properties have long dotted the New York skyline. But if he can't post a more than $460 million bond by today, those buildings and his bank accounts could be in jeopardy. Have some of the greatest assets in the world. Today's bond is required to cover the judgment that found Trump inflated the value of key properties and his net worth to secure favorable loans while he appeals the verdict. New York Attorney General Letitia James told ABC News she's ready to act if he doesn't come up with the funds. We will ask the judge to seize his assets. James has already filed the judgment from the trial in Westchester County, where Trump's golf resort and Seven Springs Estate are located. But going after Trump's properties may take time, says CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleeman. It's not simply that the sheriff walks over there and says, I've got a piece of paper and now this property belongs to the state of New York. The process is not simple. It is cumbersome. It is complicated. Last week, Trump's lawyers wrote securing the bond would be a practical impossibility after being turned down by at least 30 companies. But on Friday, the former president claimed on True Social without proof that he did have almost $500 million in cash. However, he wanted to spend it on his campaign instead. They're trying to put my father out of business. They're trying to take all his resources that he would otherwise put into his own campaign for, for presidency. This morning, former President Trump is expected to appear in a New York courtroom for a hearing in a separate criminal case where he's accused of falsifying business records to hide payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. He's pleaded not guilty. Now, jury selection was scheduled to start today until the Manhattan DA said he had 30 days possibly to delay as new records were being produced. Trump's attorneys have asked for longer, and today the judge could set a trial date. So, Bob, the question that people will have, Trump supporters will say this is a witch hunt. Others will say, can Letitia James point to any other incident that, similar to this, where she's prosecuted an individual at the level that she's prosecuted the former president? The politics of all this, TBD. It's going to play out over the coming months, but we do know it's a logistical nightmare for Trump. He's going to have to sit in a courtroom for at least six weeks for that criminal trial. All right. You're following it all for us, Bob. We thank you as always, my friend. Appreciate it. Now to Russia, where four men accused in Friday's deadly terror attack in Moscow were taken to court over the weekend, appearing badly bruised and battered. Russia says three have admitted their guilt. ISIS also released video they claim shows the start of the assault, which killed more than 130 people. It's the deadliest terror attack in Russia in nearly 20 years. Deborah Pata is following this in a warning. Her report contains images some people may find disturbing. Blindfolded, bruised and beaten, the terror suspects were quickly brought to court. While investigators continued to survey the smoldering wreckage of the aftermath over the weekend. On Friday night, armed men in combat fatigues burst into the Kroka City Hall near Moscow, a popular concert venue, and methodically began shooting the audience before setting the place ablaze. Videos posted on social media show people screaming and ducking for cover as the gunmen fired round after round of automatic gunfire. Outside, the building was engulfed in flames. Inside, Concertgoers tried to escape the relentless gunfire, trapped in a crush of panicked people. Another video shows assailants moving with deadly intent through the complex as they gunned people down. Dozens were killed or injured. When Russian President Vladimir Putin finally spoke to a shocked nation, he ignored the glaring failure of his security forces to prevent the assault, despite a U.S. warning a few weeks earlier that ISIS was planning to strike. Not only did they fail to prevent the attack, but the response was sluggish with it taking almost an hour 
for uh, federal forces to arrive at the site. Although ISIS has claimed responsibility, Putin pointed a finger at Ukraine, saying an escape route had been prepared on the Ukrainian side. It is a charge Ukraine flatly denies, and the U.S. has categorically repudiated, but Russia needs Ukraine as a scapegoat. Politically, it can't be ISIS for them, because that would just show how inept and incompetent they've become. Jeff Horn added that the ISIS attack succeeded precisely because of Russia's incompetence and intelligence failures, and it came just days after Putin won a questionable landslide election victory. Vlad? Deborah Padham, thank you. Well, tens of thousands of you in the Northeast are still without power this morning after snow and ice hammered parts of the region over the weekend. The storm knocked down tree limbs and took out power lines from upstate New York to Maine. And now a new storm is bringing blizzard conditions to parts of the upper Midwest with blasts of heavy snow and gusty winds. For more on this, let's bring in meteorologist Stephanie Abrams with our partners at the Weather Channel. Steph, good morning. Jerika, good morning. A disruptive snowstorm is underway from the plains to the Midwest. It will be an all-day event with winds gusting over 50 miles an hour, whiteout conditions, impossible travel at times, and power outages. Tomorrow, our low pulls north, and conditions will improve as we go throughout the day. Five to eight inches of snow will fall from Nebraska to Minnesota, some spots getting double digits. On the southern side, it's severe weather. A Torcon of 5 out of 10 means a few tornadoes are likely, and one to two inch an hour rainfall rates could cause flooding. A line of storms from the Midwest to the Gulf Coast will push east throughout the day, continue overnight into tomorrow. Tuesday storms won't be as potent, but you can still get thunder, lightning, damaging winds, and an isolated tornado. For more in-depth coverage, you can watch the Weather Channel on cable or live on your favorite TV streaming devices. Jerika, we're not quite finished with the cool temps. Below average highs slide in behind the system. All right, Stephanie Abrams with great information. As always, thank you. New trouble for United Airlines. CBS News has learned federal regulators are considering placing temporary restrictions on United after several troubling incidents over the past month, including a wheel falling off a Boeing 777 taking off in San Francisco. There's that video again. And a jet sliding off the runway after landing in Houston. Chris Van Cleve is at the Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport tracking developments this morning. Chris, good morning to you. Well, good morning. The FAA is responding to those notable incidents and essentially could decide to halt United's ability to grow for some period of time. A part of this will be increased FAA oversight of United's operations and reviewing company procedures to see if the carrier is, quote, effectively managing safety. CBS News has learned the FAA is also considering a series of potential temporary measures, including halting new routes the airline is not already selling tickets for, pausing its ability to put new planes into service, and or halting United from approving newly promoted captains to fly. The airline says it has not been notified of any final decisions. These internal FAA discussions may be ongoing, so it's unknown which, if any of these actions, regulators may ultimately move forward with, but they could come just as the summer travel season is ramping up. Now, United CEO Scott Kirby, in a letter to customers last week, said safety is United's highest priority, and the airline is studying each of these incidents, looking for lessons it can learn to improve its operation. It's not uncommon for these FAA reviews to take up to six weeks. We'll be watching. Chris, thank you very much. Overseas, there are reports of possible progress on a deal that would see hostages in Gaza released in exchange for Palestinian prisoners held in Israel. The news comes just days after U.S. negotiators made a proposal aimed at a temporary ceasefire in the war with Hamas. That's according to an Israeli official, as reported by Reuters. Around 40 of the approximately 130 Israeli hostages would be set free in the plan sent to Hamas. Up to 800 Palestinians would be released in exchange. Princess Kate's announcement that she has cancer has led to a new reckoning about how the royal family is covered in the press, while also raising questions about what's ahead as she requests privacy for her family. Holly Williams has more on what we know and don't know about what the princess is facing. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. The Princess of Wales did not say what type of cancer she's being treated for, but she shared that she's in the early stages of preventative chemotherapy. I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal. 
the shock announcement has prompted apologies from some celebrities, including Blake Lively, who either speculated about Kate's health or mocked this manipulated photo released by the palace on Mother's Day. Others are under pressure to follow suit. Are the last few weeks a wake-up call for public decency and compassion? I think that many people now that they know will be thinking again about some of the things that they said, some of the jokes that they made. And Julian Payne is a former spokesman for King Charles. The King is also battling cancer and in a statement praised Kate for her courage. Seeing her sat on the bench in her jeans and jump, it felt very relatable. She is both a sort of mystical figure as a princess, but actually she's also a mum sat on a park bench in a stripy jumper. Kate is one of the most famous women in the world, but also a 42-year-old woman with a cancer diagnosis and three young children she wants to protect. For CBS Mornings, Holly Williams, London. And CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook is joining us now. Uh, Dr. LaPook, in Princess Kate's own words, she says she's in the early stages of receiving preventative chemotherapy. What does that mean? Yeah, I think I've been speaking to people over the weekend and that word preventative was confusing. You know, the medical term we usually use is adjuvant chemotherapy. So what you're preventing is if there happen to be microscopic little cancer cells there that you can't see, and we don't know if there are or, aren't, or there aren't, you're giving chemotherapy with the thought of killing them now when they're most vulnerable rather than giving it time to grow up and multiply and spread and form metastases. And doctors said they found this cancer after this abdo abdominal surgery. Is it uh, likely to find sort of, you know, cancer or signs of it after a surgery? You know, it can happen when you, say, take out a surgical specimen and then it looks okay and then you slice it up and you look in the pathology department and you say, oh, there are a few cancer cells there. Mm -hmm. These days, with all the scans that we do, uh, often you do a CAT scan beforehand, for example, you see a mass there. And then during the operation, you're actually looking in the abdomen, you say, oh, oh, look, I, I'm surprised, I, I didn't realize, but, you know, th there's cancer there. But that didn't happen here. So this happened after the fact. And to me, that was sort of something that said, well, maybe, you know, we don't know the details here, maybe uh, that suggests that it was found in a relatively early stage mm -hmm. because they only found out about it afterwards. Dr. LaPook, the medical side of this is, is clear, or as clear as it can be. The psychological side of this is something you know a lot about. You've dealt with <laughs> patients in general who have cancer diagnoses. They've got to fight it medically. What happens psychologically when you get news like this? Yeah, I'm really happy uh, for this question. And we're not talking about um, uh, Kate Middleton right now. Let's talk about just my, my patient who happens to be diagnosed with, with whatever. It could be cancer, it could have, have a bypass surgery or whatever. They have the medical healing that happens at the beginning. And you know that happens over a period of weeks or perhaps a little bit longer. And that goes over. But then weeks or even months later, mm -hmm. especially if it's something that was really sort of surprising, they were in this fight flight mode at the beginning, the adrenaline's going, the cortisol's going, and that dies down. And then they go back to their normal life. They could bolt up in bed, and I've had patients do this, two in the morning, and think in a cold sweat and think, wow, that was a bullet that just went by, head, by, by my head. And it can be destabilizing. Yeah. They can have anxiety and depression. And what I've learned to do, it has a beginning, middle, and an end. And I've, I've immunized my patients. I say, look, this could happen. I warned them about it. And they've come back to me and said, thank you so much. It did happen. And then we talk about it. Sometimes I'll give them a little something to you know, relax them for just a, a short period of time. But that immunizing people and warning them this could happen has been really important in my own, my own practice. That's why you're such a great doctor. Yeah. You're not just a practitioner, but you're a person uh, throughout, and you help everyone come back to the humanity that's at the center of this. So thank you very much, thank Dr. LaPook. Appreciate it. Buzzer beaters, overtime, cheers, tears, and nonstop March Madness action over the weekend. Jan Crawford, our courts correspondent, following it all. Bounce, Garcia. Oh! With just seconds left on the clock, this three-pointer sent Houston and Texas A&M into a thrilling overtime battle Sunday night. The Aggies came back from a 12-point deficit in the last two minutes of the game. Shed, the hop, the floater. But it wasn't enough to upset the mighty Houston Cougars in extra time. Newton streaks in for the Husky stuff. The defending champions, the Yukon Huskies, also showing their power. Johnson, slam it down! Sailing into the Sweet 16 after shutting down Northwestern. Out a 
round. And for the first time in 11 years, the Marquette Golden Eagles punched their ticket to the Sweet 16. It's gratitude. Gratitude for these guys, our fans, our guys hanging in there, continuing to fight. And now we get to keep playing. On the women's side. Crowds wide open. A thrilling back and forth between Iowa State and Stanford came down to the wire. With this dagger in overtime helping the Cardinal fly into the Sweet 16, a victory led by Kiki Arafin, who scored a career-high 41 points. Back to Tesla. And the South Carolina Gamecocks extended their undefeated season, trouncing North Carolina by 47 points. Another steal for Clark. And tonight, Caitlin Clark gets one more shot at playing in front of her home crowd after Iowa defeated Holy Cross in their opening matchup. Obviously, I only got one more time to play in this building, and I love this place a lot, so I'm going to enjoy every single second on Monday. I mean, okay, that was a great game, but uh, somebody in the control room is a huge Houston fan. Who's that? It's our executive producer and her parents, Shauna Thomas. Yeah, her parents both went there. All right there, so they're alive. They're still in it to win it. That's right. Let's right. go, Houston. Okay, all right, all right.